it gives me great uh, pleasure this evening to bring greetings on behalf of the Vice President, Nick Rajayas, who could not be with us this evening. The CAFE Scientific uh, Scientific are coordinated and hosted by the Office of Vice President of Research and International, with financial support from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, Canada's largest health research funding agency. This year's series of CAFEs are sponsored by the Institute of Infection and Immunity, and we thank them for that sponsorship. I'd also like to thank the University CIHR delegate, Dr. Peter Catini, who submits the grant application for these important cafes. Cafe Scientifique started in the late 20th century as an informal discussion about scientific subjects. They were never intended to be lectures. The same holds true for the University of Manitoba Cafe Scientifique. They provide insight into health-related issues of popular interest to the general public, and in turn provoke questions and provide answers. We have an exciting and relevant topic for discussion at tonight's cafe. One that has obviously res resonated with many of you, or you would not be here tonight. The battle against the flu virus. I'd like to introduce your moderator for this evening, who will tell you more about the panelists and some of the ground rules that will guide our discussion this evening. Dr. Greg Hammond has more than 35 years of infectious disease experience in the areas of research, clinical care, and public health policy and program development. He has served in many senior capacities and leadership roles at the provincial and national levels. Dr. Hammond received his training at the universities of McGill, Alberta, Toronto, and Manitoba, as well as at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia. He is a professor in the departments of medical microbiology and medicine at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Hammond is currently a clinical consultant in the section of infectious diseases, Department of Medicine, Health Sciences Center, and Grace General Hospital. Dr. Hammond is a board member on the chair of the nominations committee of the Pan-Provincial Vaccine Enterprise, PREVENT, which works with the three universities of British Columbia, Dalhousie, and Saskatchewan to accelerate early candidate vaccine development. With that, I'd like you to please join me in welcoming Dr. Hammond. Research Institute and also the Institute of Pharmacopathy in Quebec. Uh, his background in virology, pharmacology, infectious diseases. He's a professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology, Medicine, and Pharmacology, and he's a very active clinician, researcher, and uh, teacher. He's published over 145 articles, 18 book chapters. So here you have a very knowledgeable individual who's going to lead us off, tell us about what flu is, and he's going to focus initially on uh, adult immunization issues. Um, and a bit of antiviral. So, over to you, Fred. Thank you, Craig. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I hope I can add something 
to this battle against the flu virus. I'd just like to briefly summarize my perspective on influenza and the flu by starting off with 1933, because it was in 1933 that the flu virus was first grown in a test tube. And that seminal piece of research then led to the opening of the discovery of research in influenza, which led through the 50s and 60s to the important realization that influenza virus caused epidemics that occur each winter, and that it was the most important cause of that. And secondly, that influenza virus infection differs from every other virus infection that afflicts us in being lethal to a proportion of people. So it has those two distinguishing features. Number one, it causes recurring epidemics. And number two, it kills people. And because of that, in the 60s, the United States Public Health Service got very interested in trying to understand what was happening to people who seemed to succumb whenever the influenza virus came through the temperate climates. And it was realized that it was causing what is called excess mortality. People were dying prematurely as a result of influenza virus infection during the winter months. So these people were dying primarily of what was signed off on their death certificates as pneumonia and influenza, but clearly many of them were dying of heart attacks and so forth. And this was a reproducible, consistent characteristic of influenza epidemics. And that observation then led the United States Public Health Service to grow the virus, to cause it to be inactivated, and to be injected as a vaccine. And those were the start, starting steps for development of the influenza vaccine as we know it now. And the first goal of that vaccine actually was to try and prevent these people from dying and succumbing to influenza in the, temp in the uh, winter months. Since then, and to the present, what has happened is that the indications for immunization have become much broader. We now realize that it indeed does cause people to die prematurely, and they are largely people who have got bad hearts, bad kidneys, bad lungs, but we also know that they have, this virus has a much larger effect and impact on such effects, uh, on such aspects of our life as the socio-economic well-being of society. And so we realize that there are a lot of young people who don't succumb to influenza each year, but who are taken out of the workforce because of influenza illness. We know that children are taken to hospital. We know that young people miss school themselves. So it has a wide-ranging effect across the entire breadth of society. And as much as that's been now concluded to be correct, there has been a push to use the vaccine to try and attenuate some of those effects across all these spectrums. So now, the, the uh, National Advisory Committee on Immunization in Canada makes a strong recommendation <coughs> that we should immunize as a priority three groups of people. Those who are at high risk of succumbing, those people who are health caregivers who could potentially give the virus to people who are at high risk, and thirdly, people who are in essential community services like policemen and so forth. So those are the three groups for which the National Committee on Immunization recommends strongly that they be immunized each year. But it has also come to the conclusion that this is a virus which can ameliorate the effects of influenza on all the spectrum of society. So it, it encourages, it doesn't recommend yet, but it encourages everybody else, healthy young people and children from the age of six months up to be immunized. So we have no situation where the national body of immunization is recommending basically that all Canadians should seriously think about getting immunized with a priority, as I said, on those three uh, groups of people. Now, as much as we have an emphasis on vaccine, and it is a, an appropriate emphasis because here's something which, in our system at least, is free, it's a single shot, and it's efficacious, uh, there's a great emphasis on it as prevention, as the most effective way to try and control influenza. But we also have drugs which can control or stop the replication of the virus and thereby interfere with the progression of the disease itself. So if people get sick from the flu, we do have drugs which can be used to help those people recover more quickly. The problem with those drugs has been the practical fact that to be useful, those drugs have to be given within 36 hours at a maximum after the flu starts. And for most of us, getting to the doctor within 36 hours of getting really sick has proved to be so difficult that these drugs have found themselves with not as big a place in our armamentarium of factors to control influenza as we would like. But we nonetheless have got both sides of this uh, 
intervention strategy in place with the vaccine and many vaccines that we use to try to prevent flu and we have some drugs which we can also use for those in whom the flu vaccine might not work or those who don't take the vaccine can still get sick. And so it's my considered view that this is an underused vaccine and it is uh, something that is costing people as individuals illness and it is costing society uh, considerably as well in the domains of economic loss in terms of productivity and time off work and so forth. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Ely. That's a very excellent overview. Uh, one of the other things, just to emphasize for its points here, is that in addition to causing disease in individuals and outbreaks, which can sometimes be worldwide outbreaks, is the speed with which flu moves. Flu is the fastest moving virus we have in a, in a communicable disease sense. And when so many people get exposed and infected after a short incubation period, we see lots of people sick potentially in a short time. Speed is an issue that, as Fred said, with antivirals, we have trouble treating individuals. So we have to do some preparation. So one of the ways we do preparation is to try and develop some vaccines. So our next speaker is Dr. Trina Racine. Uh, Trina has a PhD in molecular virology from Dalhousie University in 2010. So she's a relatively recent graduate. Um, she got awards for being uh, uh, recognized for her excellence in research at Dalhousie University. And she then came to the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg to work as a postdoctoral fellow, where in that capacity she's been developing phase one clinical trials for a new influenza vaccine. And that's what she's going to tell us about today. Thank you, everyone. Um, as Greg just mentioned, I'm Trina Racine. I'm the can you all hear Trina? No. no. She's, she's about to speak almost like they say in the music room. Swallow the microphone. Where's the microphone? No. Can you hear me? How about now? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thanks. No? Okay. Just talk really closely to the microphone. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Um, as you mentioned, I'm currently working on the development of new influenza vaccines um, and how we do that once the vaccines have been developed in the research lab, they have to then go through what we call clinical trials and there are three phases of fourth um, post-marketing. So I work mainly on phase one clinical trials. And the reason why we're doing this is although we currently have an influenza vaccine that hopefully everyone gets every year, um, the, the, the vaccine that's currently out there is not 100% efficient in everybody. We know that there are, unfortunately, some people who don't react as well as we would like to the vaccine, and so they're not protected even though they've received it. Another issue with the current seasonal flu vaccine is that um, they only have three different strains of virus in that vaccine, and so if the popular strain that's infecting people this current season isn't in that vaccine, although you may have received it, it won't be protective for you. And so what people are trying to do is develop better vaccines so that they'll be protected against a larger number of influenza strains. So that way, um, even if we guess wrong as to what the popular strain is going to be this year, we're more likely to be protected. And so we're developing new platforms um, for new vaccines. And what I mean by that is the current vaccine is developed or produced in eggs. And so researchers and scientists, they take the um, one part of the influenza virus, they purify it, and they put it into the vaccine. But unfortunately, this process takes a long time, from approximately six months. And so if there's a pandemic, that's really not going to help anybody. So in addition to trying to improve the efficacy of the vaccine um, and the number of people that it can protect, we're also trying to develop new vaccines to speed up the process of you know, being able to produce it in the, in the laboratory and get it into people. And so what, I'm, what I've been working on lately with actually Dr. Aoki on one of my clinical trials is a DNA-based influenza vaccine. And so instead of actually having virus protein in the vaccine, we just have DNA. The DNA gets in injected into someone, and your body produces the protein that your body would then produce protective antibodies against. And so that's a new type of what we call a platform vaccine. So, um, like I say, this way we can produce that much faster in the laboratory. When a strain is identified in the public as going to be causing 
um, pandemics or epidemics, then we can produce that much quicker and get it out to the public. Another type of uh, vaccine platform that we're working on right now is called uh, virus virus-like particles. And so they're not actually viruses, but they look like a virus, which will cause your immune system to react to it so that you produce, once again, those antibodies that uh, will help protect you if you were to actually encounter that type of virus. And so once these type these platforms have been just developed in the research laboratory, they then have to go through uh, a number of tests in the public to make sure that they're safe and that they actually produce a good response. And so the first phase of a clinical trial is called phase one, and it's a safety trial because we want to ensure that it's not going to cause any harm to the individual. So we have small trials, usually 50 to 100 people who volunteer to take part in these trials. They can be blind, which means that you don't know what you're receiving. You could be receiving the new vaccine or you could be receiving a control. So you're blinded or it could be unblinded where you know what you're getting. And the researchers will gather all the data from these safety trials and to make sure that in fact it is safe to be used and then larger trials are going to occur after that where they look more at the how the vaccine reacts with the person and do they actually produce antibodies and are they protective, that kind of thing. And so, like I said, there's phase one, two and three and four as well once they get post-marketing, and it is only at that point that a vaccine becomes eligible to be marketed in a country. And so this process actually takes quite a long time, 10, 15, 20 years. So by the time a drug actually reaches the market, it could have taken 20, 30 years from the time it was on the bench and developed, or you know, someone had the idea of let's, let's do this. So that's kind of one of the reasons why all your drugs cost so much money. Um, so yeah, so I'm in the stage of helping researchers bring their ideas, their new vaccine platforms, um, through clinical trials so that they can eventually be on the market. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to turn over to the vaccine program. One of the things we can be sure about is that uh, virtually all of you will have or will get influenza. Nobody is, is inherently totally immune to influenza. And uh, there's nothing more pathetic when, than when young children get sick with influenza. So our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Joanne Emery. Dr. Emery is a pediatrician and a pediatric infectious disease specialist. She's a professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and Pediatrics at the University of Manitoba. She's the site coordinator for the Impact Vaccine Surveillance Program, which is a Canada-wide vaccine surveillance initiative. Uh, she's also site coordinator for uh, the Canadian National Infection Prevention and Surveillance Program, CNIS, is the acronym for that. And uh, Joanne also works with the Mental Institute for Child Health as a, as a researcher. So she has a broad perspective on pediatric infectious diseases and is a researcher and teacher as well. Uh, Dr. Emery is going to uh, speak to us uh, specifically about some of the impacts of influenza on children and the importance of children in influenza and also her experience with the H1N1 uh, flu that affected children uh, so strongly in 2009 when she was on service at the Children's Hospital, uh, sort of in, in the trenches on the front lines. So, Dr. Emery. Thank you. Um, God knows if this works. By the way, I take my glasses off. I have bifocals, and you have no idea what this microphone looks like. <laughs> <laughs> at this moment, I can see the people in the front row. Um, I'm going to take you back to June 2009. And what happened in June 2009 is all of a sudden we had a lot of children who were sick with influenza. Fortunately, they were, we didn't have a lot of children who were sick with anything else. So it was essentially the only thing that we were dealing with. What had happened was obviously that's when swine flu came and it sort of hit us from the north. We weren't expecting it to come from the northern communities because um, it was in Mexico, and then all of a sudden it was in our north. So, in clinical research, sometimes there's a bit of an opportunity to learn a lot in the midst of a complete and total chaotic situation. And when we started to have a lot of patients, what we did was, in order to look after them all, we basically speaking um, ignored our own rules and regulations, which were not to start oseltamivir if a patient had been sick for more than 20, 48 hours, 
And also, not to start also Tamivir, which is the Tammy food, the drug, if we didn't have a diagnosis. So what we did was, every child who was admitted to hospital, we started them on the antiviral drug and um, did the testing and took them off the drug if they didn't have the flu. And what we noticed very quickly was these children were getting better very quickly. So children were coming down from the north, they were seen, they were looked after, they were started on the Tammy flu, and within about two days they were getting better. And before they finished the Tammy flu, they were on the plane back home, which was incredibly good and um, uh, made us feel better. It also allowed us to have the large number of patients come through the hospital and get out. So what we did is we looked back and it worked out unbelievably well. You couldn't have designed it any better, but what we had was about one third of the children who had been admitted for influenza that year had had the seasonal flu, the flu that was circulating beforehand. They had not been treated with oseltamivir. They had come to hospital, they had pneumonia, and we had their clinical course. We had about one half of the children, or one third of the population, had um, come into our hospital and we retrospectively found out that they had the H1, H1N1 flu. And they had also not been treated with oseltamivir at the beginning. They got treated maybe a little bit later. later. And then we had the large number of children that came in in a short period of time that we had treated. And so when we looked at this, we actually found a couple of things. One we found was children under the age of 14, when they showed up with the swine flu, actually had the same clinical presentation and they were just as sick, they had the same symptoms, as the children who had had the routine flu. It was the kids over 14 that had presented with the awful lung disease. So they were a different population. They had a disease we hadn't seen before, but for children under 14, the flu was the same, no matter if it was the uh, seasonal flu or the new flu that was coming in. And the other thing that we found out was that by treating the children with oseltamivir, when we looked at it, they went out of hospital, even though they came in with very severe pneumonia, in on average four and a half days. The children that hadn't treated with oseltamivir went out of hospital on average 14 and a half days. So we weren't a funded study. The drug company didn't ask us to do this. We were basically speaking doing something with their backs to the wall. And we actually discovered that use of oseltamivir in children admitted with pneumonia makes a difference no matter how long they've been sick. When you look back at the clinical trials for which were done on relatively healthy people who never ended up in hospital, if you have a disease that lasts on average five or six days, it makes sense that if you treat them after two or three days, you're not really going to see much of a difference. So we um, extrapolated from that that a disease that was going to last a lot longer, it would be better to treat even though they had been longer than 48 hours who were ill. So with those pieces of information, what we now do is any child that's admitted to the hospital who may have flu, we start them on oseltamivir while we try to sort it out. We've been very lucky because it improved the ability to make diagnosis. Really and truthfully, before H1N1, before 2009, we didn't have a very good way to rapidly diagnose influenza. They had to grow it, so you get the result back in five, 10 days, which is not all that useful if you're trying to do rapid testing. Now, with a lot of the new technologies, if you watch um, uh, uh, NCIS, you watch all the programs, you see the DNA and everything, so that's what they do. And they can do those testing, and we can get the result back the next day, whether or not somebody has influenza or not. So for us, it's great. We can start them on the anti-flu drug, and we can usually get the result back within a day or two. So if they have the flu, we continue. If they don't have the flu, we stop. And at the meantime, we look for other things. So it has dramatically changed how we practice medicine based on influenza. And what we learned here, we told everybody else, and so that we're not alone in doing that. So we published a paper on that. So it does tell you that on the ground, in clinical opportunities, we do research here too, and we use it to change practice. The other thing that we noticed was is that children who present with influenza don't necessarily present with, I've got the flu. You know what the flu is. Could somebody find the license plate of the truck that just hit me? Here, that's it. Kids don't tend to present that way. And as a result, they don't always get recognized as having the flu. So before we had those diagnoses, we found that we had transmitted flu from one child to another child in the hospital. 
They may have gotten it from one child to another child, or visitors came in with the flu, because you actually can pass the flu on from one person to another before you yourself get sick. So what we did in the middle of H1N1 was we did what we would call a bundle of um, interventions. We didn't try one thing, we tried everything we thought would work. So first and foremost, we did visiting restriction into the hospital. Second thing we did, unfortunately, is we closed the playroom. So the nurses put up a lot of sad dog signs in the playroom because kids couldn't go there anymore. They're still closed and we still feel guilty. But that kept the kids out of the playroom and playing with each other. And the other thing is, is we made sure everybody followed their um, precautions, that they washed their hands between every patient. We had a very nice volunteer that made sure everybody who came into the hospital washed their hands. And um, on the ward, people self-policed. If you saw somebody that was in danger of contaminating themselves, you warned them that, you know, you could get sick. Because keep in mind, it was the adults that were getting really sick, so our healthcare professionals could do it. And we did all of this without a, an, an immunization program at that point because it was too early. And so as a result of doing this, we didn't really need to do very much fancy, but we stopped the transmission of influenza into our hospital. You may or may not have noticed the um, announcements last year around Christmas time where we put a visiting, visiting um, uh, prohibition on coming to the children's hospital. Part of that was flu, part of that was RSV which is another virus, but so we've used what we've learned in the H1N1 epidemic that June to change how we uh, monitor things in the hospital and how we try to prevent children in the hospital who are sick with other illnesses from getting the flu. The final thing is, is we do advocate for healthcare workers to get the influenza vaccine. We do advocate for children from the age of six to two years of six months to two years of age to get the vaccine. Children under six months of age don't respond very well to the vaccine, so we have to hope that their health care providers and their parents are, in, are immunized. But the children from six months to two years of age can get severely ill, and um, to protect them, we recommend that they get the influenza vaccine. So I'll stop here, but we'll answer questions later. Thank you very much, Dr. Children also uh, shed lots of virus. They're actually very, very good at shedding more virus than, uh, than adults and for longer periods of time. So that helps in the transmission of flu in the community. Uh, so, uh, so thank you for those perspectives. And there's lots of grandparents and parents here tonight who uh, probably understand the importance of flu in children. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Kevin Coombs. Uh, Dr. Coombs uh, has a PhD in microbiology from the University of Texas. He did uh, postgraduate work at Harvard University and then was recruited to Manitoba where he's advanced up the academic ladder. He's a professor in the Department of Medical Microbiology and, uh, and cross appointments in physiology. And, uh, and uh, he also uh, has the position of being the assistant dean of research, which uh, supports and advocates for research across the whole of the University Faculty of Medicine. Um, he's the acting head of the Department of Medical Microbiology, just having taken over from Dr. Embry, who just stepped down after 12 years as being the head of the department. So. Um, Kevin is following in very good footsteps here, and we're uh, going to be listening to Kevin talk about the internal battle in the uh, fight with influenza inside the cell. Uh, we still don't understand all the mechanisms by which the virus causes damage in the host, or we don't fully understand all the mechanisms by which influenza can be stopped. So Dr. Coombs is going to tell us some of those perspectives. Thank you, Greg. So I'm going to start off at a very basic level, first of all. You might call it Virology 101. So one of the things that's been mentioned so far is that, of course, influenza is a virus. So one big question is, well, what in the world is a virus? Put pretty simply, viruses are incredibly simple organisms. In fact, there's debate as to whether they might even be considered living organisms or not. And part of the reason they're so simple is they've learned to parasitize a host cell. So viruses cannot grow by themselves. They have to have a cell in which to grow. And so the virus gets away with being very simple because it hijacks what's in the cell. So to take that slightly further and put it in a little bit of perspective, I'm just going to ask a question here. If I were to ask you if anyone knows what if is or if you know someone who uses an EpiPen or knows what allergies are, Okay, so there's a few people nodding. Show of hands, maybe? 
Actually, quite a few of you. Very good. So I, I'm sure the clinicians up here are going to cringe, but I'm going to give a very simplistic overview. That basically what's happening in the case of an EpiPen is that it's an attempt to use simple chemicals to blunt what our body is normally doing. Because we see all sorts of allergens in the environment all the time, and our bodies mount an immune response. Sometimes that immune response is too good, and we go into what's called anaphylactic shock. So the EpiPen is there to prevent our body from carrying out too exuberant of its normal function. Now the reason that I mention that in this context is it turns out that the really bad viruses of influenza, like the 1918 virus, the pandemic in 2009, the bird flu that you've probably heard about, those are all deadly, not because it's the virus infecting us per se, but it's because of our body's response to the virus. So my lab has been looking at how we can develop slightly different types of antivirals. And part of the strategy here is, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, the virus itself is incredibly simple. The host cell, by comparison, is extremely complicated. Where viruses may have one to 10 genes, some viruses have more than that, each of our cells has tens of thousands of genes, and each of those genes encodes tens to dozens of slightly different forms of proteins. So our cells have hundreds of thousands of different permutations of cellular proteins. So we've taken the idea that while it's very good, and we've all benefited over the last 40, 50 years maybe for vaccine development, all the current vaccine development is directed against the virus. So because viruses have to use cells, we're starting to look at what's required in the cell. Maybe we can target that as a complementary type of approach. So what my lab's been doing the last couple of years is trying to screen for host proteins, which the virus is absolutely dependent upon, but which our cells don't necessarily require similar to the EpiPen. So if we can knock these host proteins down temporarily, maybe that will do something to plump the virus without harming us in the long run. So I, I have a brilliant PhD student who's just finished. I, I won't embarrass her by pointing her out, but she's actually here. And what she did was she screened the entire human genome to see if there were any such host genes and proteins that we could find. And it turned out that we found a dozen different host proteins, which if you knock them down, not only does not harm our host cell, but when the virus infects these cells, which have these individual proteins diminished, the virus grows a little bit, but the cell survives. So instead of the cell being killed, the cell is survive. Now all of this work is being done in cell culture in the laboratory. As Trina mentioned a little while ago, it's going to be years, maybe decades, before this type of work could be carried translationally into animals, or eventually humans. But that's where we're trying to go. So we're trying to do a, a host strategy to understand what the cell contributes to the virus that we can exploit. So thank you very much for that very clear explanation of what's happening inside the cells in an influence of infection. So you can see the battle is being fought on many fronts, uh, at the molecular level, and clinical level, and the developmental level. And uh, that's the perspective we're bringing here initially. And we'd now like to hear your questions, and we're going to open it up to the floor. We were supposed to have a handheld microphone that we could carry around. So we would ask you to try and speak loudly so we can hear your questions, and we will um, direct them to the appropriate individual. And uh, again, we'll take our last question at about 8.25. So first, uh, first question. Yes, yeah, so to Dr. Coombs. Uh, in regards to the virus and its invasion of, of, of uh, our, our, our normal cells in our body, has there ever been an invasion or a cross-reference or cross uh, uh, anything happening between uh, uh, viruses and bacteria? Could I ask the, the 
panelists to please repeat the question because it's being audio taped as well so that all people can eventually hear the question. So the, the question as I understand it is, are there any known examples where what the virus is doing inside a cell is either affected by or if the virus itself affects bacteria? Well, it, does it ever use bacteria as a host? In other words, do they join forces and produce something that's even worse? Okay, so I'm going to start off probably overly simply here. Um, viruses are capable of infecting everything on the planet that's animate. So there are viruses that infect bacteria. There are viruses that infect plants. There are viruses that infect elephants. There are viruses that infect us. Generally speaking, viruses that can infect bacteria do not infect us per se. Viruses that infect plants don't infect bacteria, don't infect us. Um, to put this in slightly different perspective, if you just look around the room, no matter how carefully the staff here are taking care of the various ornaments that you see, let me ask you, anyone hazard a guess as to how many viruses are probably floating around in this room right now? Somewhere in a million trillions. <laughs> Go higher. <laughs> but my question was geared at this specifically. Right. The idea is we as human beings are kept alive by a certain bacteria that lives in our gut. The by many bacteria of them. doesn't exist in many, yeah, but that, that, we, we don't exist if that bacteria isn't there. So if we get a virus that comes in and kills off your gut bacteria, what happens then? In many cases, you'll probably be recolonized by that same bacteria being provided by another host because we all live in close proximity to each other. I think that's a question that could probably be better addressed by the clinicians. But, but the point is, yes, there are viruses all over the place. Some of them are parasites of bacteria. There, there have been some recent studies that suggest that the viruses and bacteria do cooperate with each other. We don't fully understand that, but it has been found that there is some cooperation. The other thing about viruses, they have specific receptors, and bacteria do not carry the receptors, so the virus doesn't infect those bacteria. So that's, that's the other part of it. Uh, any other questions? Um, I have a question regarding, I have a question regarding the vaccine against the virus. Um, I Right, so the comment was that uh, Canada has, has, is not permitting the distribution of a flu vaccine that has four strains in it, which has been recommended by some regulatory bodies. For instance, in the United States, they have what are called quadrivalent vaccines. There are four different viruses in them contributing to this year's vaccine. My understanding is that the reason why we don't have that yet in Canada is that no company has produced one tested it and asked our Health Canada regulatory agency for permission to market. I'm sure if they did, if they did the required tests, we would have a four-valent vaccine available for us. But first, it'd be better if we could use up the three-valent one with more gusto. <laughs> I guess another panel would ask the audience, um, how many people here have had to find out how to shot this uh, season? I think we just had the question posed to us. <laughs> Has here anyone who's had their flu shot this year? Okay. Did you get the answer you wanted? I was just curious. Were, were you expecting? Well, of course, it, it's, a, it's an audience which probably is already um, mm -hmm. preaching to the converted. Okay. okay. So here's a question that must have come in uh, by a tweet. No. No? Okay, all right. So the specific question is, what is your response to uh, all the chemicals found in the vaccines that many people react to? And uh, some examples. Uh, use of peanut oil used for vaccines in the past has made a large saving population of peanuts. Uh, let's stop at that one, and this might be a question for Dr. Emery. Uh, take it to that point. Um, I'm going to go 
complete ignorance on the pinot oil, sorry. Um, uh, essentially, because um, I'm actually not sure about that. I, I, to my knowledge, pinot oil has never ever been used in a vaccine. Okay, good. So no, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Very that. Okay. Convinced about that. Um, essentially, um, because there's a lot of work on vaccine safety, um, what is done with vaccines is that the minimum amount of additional material is put in the vaccine. Okay. If you have a vaccine, for instance, that you're, you're going to be giving and um, 100 people are going to get vaccinated from that vial, all right, then they'll have to put something in that vial to make sure that it doesn't get contaminated with bacteria, etc. And so, for the most part, they don't try to um, manufacture vaccines in 100-dose vials. They'll manufacture it in a single-dose vial so that it's one time only opening it up, so you don't need to have the preservatives in that to protect against um, bacterial infection. So there's a number of things like that that's been done. There's a lot of safety testing that gets done, taking a look at reactions to vaccine, et cetera, so that they try to minimize it. But there's no question about it. There's probably going to be a component that somebody's allergic to vaccines on one of them. I am relying on you guys to get your flu vaccine because I react to something in the vaccines and it's more than one vaccine I react to. So I need you guys to do it. And it's in the daily one. It's a fact of life. So, um, but they do try to minimize it. They do try to study it. And they don't put anything unnecessary in the vaccine. I was just going to say that question to Trina because I think one of the searches one of the areas in which they're searching to improve vaccines is indeed to try and produce vaccines that don't require that the virus be grown in, in, the, in the more common situation in embryonic chicken egg. Because no matter how much you purify, you cannot get out the last molecule of chicken protein. So it, it is the substrate itself in which you're growing the virus that adds this kind of difficulty to vaccine. Okay. Is it fair to say, Trina, that that's one of the that's, of your research? Absolutely, yeah. So that's definitely one of the the propelling things of uh, the new platforms that are out there. And so, as I mentioned earlier, one of the new ways we're trying to make a vaccine is with DNA. So all, all that you really would be injecting is DNA and water, uh, or saline, which is kind of what your body has anyway. And so that way, there aren't, like you say, any potential chicken proteins left over from the way you made the, uh, the vaccine. Um, and this way, it's your body who's making the protein that it's then going to also re react to, uh, to, to give you that protective response. So safety is first and foremost on all the regulatory authorities' minds when they're testing new vaccines. Like I say, it's the very first thing that they do, um, those first tests that we have to do to make sure that it can then proceed on to the next level of testing. Before they, the regulators, they don't even care if it works, they just want to make sure it's safe, is the very first thing. So, like you say, they're going to try and prevent any additional materials having to be put into that vaccine um, because there could then be reactions that we're talking about. So, the new platforms out there are trying to do just that, just have one single component, um, so that way there'll be less reactions. So I'm just going to continue because there are several other questions here. So the related question was the use of mercury compounds, etc., connected to disorders. Uh, again, Dr. Reed, Dr. Yoki, about mercury and flu vaccines. Well, Dr. Henry can probably speak to this more cogently than I can, but I'm pretty sure it's clear now that thimerosal, which is the uh, mercury preservative that's been used to inhibit the growth of bacteria, has been limited to, as Dr. Henry said, to vials in which you had to put many doses into which you have to put the syringes, many different syringes, I'm sorry, get different doses out. So when they produce single dose, single doses of vaccines, they now make them without the I think that's been a legitimate concern of the uh, vaccine population, the public and mothers, concerned about their kids and so forth. But I would say that the amounts of thimerosalines that have been used through the years have been, I think, so it would be very, very safe, even though children get used to get many different vaccines with thimerosal in it. But manufacturers are trying to get rid of these kinds of preservatives and we've made the biggest step in terms of mercury. I mean, the thing is with the type of mercury that 
thimerosal is. It's an inactive form, so it is a safe form and it disappears very quickly. Um, and there's not actually been a true association with thimerosal and any problem. However, that said, um, it did bring up the issue of you don't need it, don't use it. And so that was where the decision was made um, about 14 years ago. And of interest, it was made in the United States where they didn't have, um, it wasn't just flu vaccine, but where they didn't have vaccines where they combined several different um, uh, antigens or protection against a number of diseases in a single shot. The kids were getting, like, the poor little guys were like pincushions because they were getting four or five shots every time. Whereas in Canada, we used only one shot. And our Canadian vaccine didn't have any thimerosal in it. And it's, the issue is around autism, et cetera, but there's been no difference in terms of the rates of autism. As a matter of fact, the rates of autism have gone up since they've taken thimerosal out of the vaccine. So it hasn't been related to that. Um, uh, but it did create a great deal of controversy. Um, uh, it, um, uh, did make people step back and take a look at what were in the vaccines and reassess it, so that was a good thing. The other thing that it did actually do is it brought autism to the forefront, and it has created a phenomenal amount of research onto autism. I don't know if any of you have uh, grandchildren or people that you know who have children with autism, but it's a range of diseases, and it can be quite debilitating. So the, the silver lining out of all the find better treatment for autism and hopefully a way to, to cure it. So the out of the controversy I think has come a lot of good things. Okay, just continuing on, uh, comment here is that natural vaccination being more powerful and longer lasting than induced vaccination being more short term requiring annual vaccination. Uh, comments on that? Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, well, I don't think natural vaccination provides any better protection than does the vaccine. And that's because the problem with natural immunity or vaccine-induced immunity is that it loses its effectiveness because the virus that's coming around the next year has changed. It's not because the immunity itself is worn away. It's because the virus that comes around next year is not related to the shock that was given this year or the influence that caused the illness and the natural immunity. So I think it's... Um, not quite correct to think that being infected with influenza is going to provide better protection next year than getting the shot. Okay. The next one is a concern that the virus taken for vaccination is already one year old by the time it is mass produced for the public. In a year's time, the actual virus is likely mutated, uh, thus being different from the one in the vaccine. Any comments on that? Well, it's uh, the vaccine that we're getting now has got viruses in it which were circulating in the southern hemisphere in Australia, South Africa this spring. And it's known that those are the viruses that end up in North America in November, December. So those are the viruses which are picked to make the vaccine in Canada to give to us in November. So in fact, they are able to keep up in most cases with producing a vaccine which is effective against the virus that eventually comes around this year. So it's a guessing game, but generally, if you look at the record of the vaccines, that are part of the that virus that are in the vaccines and the viruses that eventually come around, there's a pretty good match. When there isn't, we do in fact endure a lot of disease, unfortunately, because of what's called vaccine mismatch. And the last question on this list is, would the host protein uh, approach not trigger an immune reaction in humans? So this question I'll direct to Dr. Coombs. So what I would speculate and, and argue, and this is what drives us, is because the idea of targeting the host is it is self, so it would not be recognized. Now, the problem with influenza, as you've heard already, is it mutates very rapidly. So most of the vaccine approaches have to be changed yearly because the virus is changing. And so there is always the possibility that even if we do identify a great host protein, which the virus needs, which if we affect it, will kill the virus, the virus will probably eventually mutate away from it. But I would argue that targeting the host actually gets around the immunity problem because it's our own protein to begin with. Thank you, Dr. Coombs. Okay, we've got some questions uh, back here. Try a new individual. First of all, over here to the left.
the question was whether I could uh, briefly review the indications for using oseltamivir. So oseltamivir is a tablet drug which has been uh, shown to be efficacious for both preventing influenza A or B and for treating people who are ill with influenza A or B. Uh, the indication is to use it optimally within at least 48 hours of the onset of the disease. And when you use it for prevention, obviously you don't have to worry about the onset of the disease, but you can use it in different ways. Sometimes we give people the vaccine and the pill at the same time if they're in the midst of a community outbreak or an institutional outbreak and you want to protect them against the flu until the vaccine kicks in and produces immunity. So that's one of the ways in which we use the drug for prevention. And there are other ways in which to use it as well. Is there, is that sufficient? I just find that we're not using it as much as like a few years ago. I think maybe after the turn of when they were using it, everybody in the team was, you know, in the fall and they're pregnant, they got, you know, a prescription for it. Oh, September. Kind of yes. So the comment was that. Uh, she didn't think that we're using very much Alstotemper anymore. Indeed, it's true that there was very little use before 2009 when the uh, swine flu pandemic struck, and there's been very little use of it thereafter. But it really showed its mettle and it showed its value, as Dr. Emery said, in the most seriously ill people. It was clearly uh, prevented death and accelerated improvement and uh, recovery. Yeah, yeah, but you're right. So, in a very healthy adult, you're not really. Well, it, it depends. If you're, I would put you that some of my patients, for instance, who are self-employed, they don't want to get sick at all. They have no insurance. They're the only person who runs their shop or they're with two or three other people. They don't want to be off even for three or four days. So they usually get the vaccine. And if they can't get the vaccine, then they want some also tamivir to have on hand. And that strategy of having the prescription on hand or the pill in their pocket to be used as quickly as they get a fever and a cough is by far the way in which to make the vaccine, the uh, drug work the most efficiently. It works much better if you can give it within hours of onset illness, but it will work up to 36 hours. And the children, I mean, we used it after 36 hours for children who were presenting with pneumonia, and um, it significantly reduced the duration of their pneumonia in hospital. So it will work later, but those are, on, those are people that aren't having the normal course of the flu. Uh, my question, uh, I guess based on my experience, uh, what you've talked about here is kind of the pharmaceutical institutionalized medicine approach. The only preventative thing you've talked about really is the vaccination. Um, I get my flu shot this time of year every year, but I travel a fair amount and have a lifestyle that takes me to places that is tropical. Uh, the year before last, I was very, very ill because I made a fundamental mistake. When I got down there, I did not follow the advice of some of the locals that said, if you drink your bush tea, which is, consists of black sage and a couple of other things. When I drink that, I did not get the flu, I did not get cold. That year I didn't, and I had about three months of not very good uh, recovery time because of the flu I got. My question is, Aside from the vaccination as a preventative step, what is being done, or is anything being done, to use preventative methods such as some of the traditional herbalist type of things? Um, the woman that makes my medicinal tea is from a long heritage of black slaves out of Africa in a tropical country. Um, there are things that work. Um, I know, for example, of Lysmaniasis, there's, a, there's a, a plant that is proven to, to, to solve that problem. Um, so, is there research being done in that type of preventative approach as opposed to the highly technical, if you don't have a lot of money, you do not have flu shots for everybody in your population, and you don't have any of these medications to give them? Well, I would say first off that uh, there's, there's probably enough vaccine around Canada for everything. I'm, I'm not talking them. about Canada. Well, I'll, I'm talking about Canada these statutes. But in terms of these others, you know, one of the problems with these non-licensed products is that uh, the fact that they're not required to pass any tests is the greatest limitation against them. Because as you may have seen on television the other night when you were looking at some of these natural products, the batch-to-batch -batch variation is such that you cannot believe that this the contents of one bottle 
that says this, it contains the same amount of this, that actually does that. And so you've got this kind of a problem with variation in natural products, and you've got a problem then that's not tested because they don't have to, because they can sell it and promote it without any proof but whatsoever. That, that's not the question I'm asking. Okay. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. In fact, my son works for Weber Naturals. However, there are no question, because a lot of pharmaceuticals do come from, from plant matter. Yep. There are natural things that can be done that are not in the form of, of immunization, vaccination, that do prevent, that can be used to prevent disease. They're not big money makers, but they do work. And the problem of, is it, you know, is the concentration, is the titration figured out, is the purity there? That, that, that's all management, that's scientific. Once you have the research and you identify, for example, that a combination, say, black sage and kulu pawpaw will help to offset or deter the onset of a flu virus, then you can do all the medical things. Then you can, then you can put control in, you can make sure that the plants are growing correctly, that there's not toxins in them, all kinds of things. Yeah, so to answer your question, is the research being done? Unequivocally, it is. I get to review a number of scientific papers. Now, they're not all going to be on black tea or this or some Chinese herbal medicine, but there certainly is that work out there being done. Some of it looks pretty promising. Some of it doesn't. I mean, as Dr. Aoki mentioned, there's this lot-to-lot -lot variability. I mean, you, you buy that argument, too. But the, the direct answer is yes, that research is being done. Well, there are good examples of that for the treatment of malaria. Natural products have been developed into effective treatments eventually. There's another approach, too, which is pharmacological. Dr. David Fetson thinks that uh, there are a lot of immune modulatory drugs, maybe that support Kevin's, uh, Kevin's idea about modifying the host uh, through other mechanisms. Uh, things like statins, which people take. Uh, there's evidence scientifically that they may have an, uh, a substantial impact on improving mortality and morbidity following flu, which is available widely around the world. So these are, these are drugs which have been tested. And there are observational studies suggesting they may have an impact. That's after the fact. I'm talking about before the fact. Okay. Well, your point's well taken, and uh, I'm not sure uh, other than what Dr. Coombs is saying. So, other questions back over here? This one is directed to Dr. Aoki. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you recognize me or not, but I was one of your subjects in regards to immunology uh, and, and vaccination for uh, the uh, herpes virus. Okay. <laughs> you work very well. <laughs> Go ahead. Anyway, uh, you know, obviously, uh, I, I, I found out later that I actually had received the actual actual uh, that, uh, vaccination that was being that was being uh, tested, not placebo. Not placebo. Okay. So yeah, now uh, I, I'm 67 now, and I'm just wondering, you know, that was back in the 90s. Uh, am I still supposed to be uh, immunized against uh, herpes simplex uh, virus or, or not? Would, would, it, would it last that long? Or do I need a booster shot? Or? <laughs> um, well, I'm not, I must admit, I'm not quite sure which vaccine you're talking about. We just have finished a big study along with 77 different centers uh, an evaluation of vaccine to prevent, to prevent herpes, general herpes. And it was done, but it was done only in women, this one. And we tested 30,000 women to find uh, individuals who didn't already have herpes by yeah. testing their blood. And then we gave half of them the vaccine, half of them got a placebo. They were followed for four years. And after four years, we couldn't find, we, there was a 22% improvement or reduction. But that was only women. And because that wasn't a substantial enough difference, we've not pursued it further. But, I'm not sure. This was prior to that. That sure must have been before that, yeah. I think we did give it to some men, but no. uh, what happened was that it did work. It worked actually in preventing herpes in 77% of the women in that trial. It didn't protect the men at all. Well, I never and had because herpes. Because of that, that <laughs> the, guy, the uh, company went to Ottawa and said, can we sell this? And they said, no, because you actually tested men and women, and you only analyzed the women part. So you have to do the whole thing again. So then we did the 32,000 women, and we found it didn't work. Okay. So can we ask if there are any questions on influenza flu? Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the concerns about getting the vaccine is that there's a lot of
I would have to say that I know of no evidence that this killed virus, this inactivated virus, in any way has a detrimental effect on the immune system. That's as best as I know. Now, I can, I can only, yes, uh, when I first came back to Winnipeg in the uh, early 80s, we were challenged, we were going to do a study of a vaccine, and one of the challenges from the ethics committee was, are you, are you sure that you're not giving people too many vaccines? And at that point, uh, there was a publication in Hands Internal Medicine looking at people some 35 years after they received many vaccines, showing that they didn't seem to be any different from people who hadn't gotten vaccines. And that was the best that we got to, as far as I knew, showing that vaccines had long-term safety. And I've not seen any more robust in the way of looking for new adverse effects of vaccines. There's no live virus in the seasonal flu vaccine. So if you feel uh, ill afterwards, it may just, like, you're not actually infected with the flu, right? It's just your body um, producing that immune response so that you can build up that protection so that if you do get infected with, a, with the actual virus, that you'll be able to fight it off better. And just because a lot of people have that unfortunate misconception or that fear of getting sick from the vaccine, that's why another reason why people are trying to develop new ways of making vaccines and having different components so that you know for sure that you can't get sick from the vaccine because there's no actual virus in it. Um, for the flu vaccine, there's not been any evidence in pediatrics that there being a problem with the immune system. The only vaccine that I know of that will alter the immune system is measles vaccine. Because measles is it's a live viral vaccine. Um, and measles itself will bring your immune system and compromise it. So that, for instance, the story I always tell, and it changed how the world went, was the fact that Henry VIII's son, Edward, was kept from everybody when he was a young boy because Henry VIII didn't want anything to happen to him. And when he became king, he then ended up being with the general population and he got exposed to tuberculosis, handled that, then he got measles and then died of overwhelming TB. So if you, if measles vaccine is the other one that can do that. Not as bad as measles, but it can reduce your immune system. But for influenza, no one can do so. Any other burning questions? Let's we'll see if we hear. If you compare two populations, one that's had a long history of There's certainly a difference in the way in which the immune system responds to subsequent doses of the influenza vaccine. This is this fits under the rubric of what's called the concept of original antigenic sin, which holds that the first influenza vaccine, and this actually pertains to a lot of different uh, biologic agents, but the first influenza virus you're exposed to causes an imprint on the immune system which then persists thereafter so that no matter which vaccine you subsequently get exposed to, the greatest response is always to that first vaccine that you got, even though you get new ones. So that a person who gets their first vaccine now is actually going to get a better response to vaccine than that person who's had that vaccine after a series of other ones. So there is some effect of getting multiple vaccines. Is that right, Kevin? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, just, I, I may guess to extend that a little bit, the reason that the flu changes so rapidly, if, if I can bore you for a few moments with basic virology, is that it has what's considered a segmented genome, it's individual pieces. And so, because it's got these individual pieces, and because there's inherent high mutability in the virus, it changes so rapidly. 
So one might argue that getting multiple doses will expose you to a lot of different viruses over the years because the vaccine is being changed periodically. And in the long run, uh, you'll probably have a stronger response each time. It might make you feel worse temporarily, but you could also argue that it will boost your immunity to a wider range of viruses, influenza viruses, if it's flu specific. Other questions? Okay. So, let me call this a flu virus mutation. Does the flu virus never come again? After the flu? Never is usually a tough <laughs> word to use. <laughs> the likelihood, well, I, I guess the thing is so the surveillance people will probably have noticed that. The same flu comes a year later periodically. It's not always changing. It changes fairly rapidly, but not always. Is that a fair assessment? I think it's just slightly different each year. No, they stay the same. Always fever and There's a range of symptoms. But um, the symptoms of one type of flu, okay, for, for us in pediatrics and kids, the symptoms, it doesn't matter what type of flu the child gets, the, symptom, the range of symptoms are about the same. Where things change is when you get a sudden shift and you see a virus that no one's ever seen before, or a virus that um, young adults and middle-aged people have not seen before. Um, a lot of times the elderly, are they've seen it when they were a child and they, their immune system remembers it. So what happens is if there's something completely different, then children react the way they always react. But um, young adults who have a vigorous immune system overcompensate when they see a flu for the first time. And that's what happened in 2009 is that there was a cohort of people, uh, like a group of people from the age of 14 to about the age of 40, that when they saw that new flu, their body went, woo, this is something bad, and overreacted to it. So that's the time that we see those type of diseases. Um, uh, and then after the flu's been circulating a bit, then everybody kind of calms down, and oh yeah, it's just regular flu. Right here in the Yeah, um, I mean, he was older than, I mean, it's older than 12, and what happened is um, we had some patients who were teenagers, and I'll honestly tell you, I've never seen people get sick that fast in my life. I mean, we had one girl who at 4 o'clock in the afternoon started to cough and was on ventilator by midnight. So it, it's a virus that rapidly causes a response, and these kids' immune response just clicked right on, and it was a massive response, and they got sick extremely fast. The only other condition I've ever seen take somebody from being relatively well to being so sick is meningococcemia. I've, I've seen that go that fast. And again, that's another one of these situations where it's the body response. So I didn't look after that child because he was in Toronto, obviously. Um, but um, it's just, it's the response to the virus. Sorry, uh, I have one more question in regards to uh, uh, response to the, to the immunization and so on. As a person with sarcoidosis, do I have to be afraid of every time I get a immune shot that my sarcoids are going to all of a sudden start picking up my immune system or, or, or whatever and, and cause problems? <laughs> so the question was whether or not a person with sarcoid should anticipate that their sarc sarcoid disease might flare up as a consequence of getting a vaccine. Flare up, yeah. I'm sure I don't know the answer to that one. I don't know what, what the answer is. I know that uh, people with sarcoid, sarcoid is an unusual disease, the cause of which isn't known, 
that's characterized by swollen lymph glands and then uh, often scarring in the lungs. Uh, and it's often treated with cortisone pills. And we know that patients who take cortisone pills and get vaccines can get unusual reactions, but I'm not aware of sarcoid itself. Okay. Well, it, it paralyzes. Just flare up as a result of that. It, 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 it coaxes coax, coax your uh, red button like a pearl. Okay. You have to cut down on your vitamin D and take it. You've got to make sure you okay. calcium. Thank you. You learned something. Okay. <laughs> no question over here. Probably a very simplistic one. Uh, I'm just curious what are the pros and cons of the nasal uh, vaccine versus the injected yeah. ones? Because I've sort of seen that there's different ways of administering it. Again, curious why Catholic. Um, the good news about the nasal vaccine is you don't need to get a shot, um, and children are quite happy about that. Um, the the downside of it is is that it is a live vaccine, so that there's the possibility that um, um, live vaccines can mutate backwards if there's another like if you happen to give somebody the live vaccine and they were exposed to chickens and had bird flu, we could end up with the vaccine strain and the bird flu strain mating and us having a really big nightmare. So that's always the back end of that. But the other thing is, is that a nasal vaccine, anytime you inhale something, if you have a propensity to asthma, you can, you can have a problem with asthma. As to why it's not in Canada, and I'll confess if it is in Canada this year, I, um, it, it actually comes down to the drug manufacturer. They have to ask to market it. And if they've got a large market in the United States that they're just barely making the production for that market, even though Canada's one-tenth of it, they don't expand out. So it, it really a lot of our medications and vaccines are solely dependent on the company asking to manufacture it in Canada. The other thing about it is the unfortunate thing is, is when they did the studies, they did the studies up to people the age, I think, of 50. And so then the question is, will it work for people over 50? So chances are it will, but they didn't do the studies because they're marketing it, marketing it for younger people. I think last year the vaccine was available in Alberta, wasn't it? The uh, nasal vaccine, quite widely in Alberta. Mm -hmm. So it is in Canada somewhere. I think among mm -hmm. adults, healthy adults, the injectable vaccine is actually better than the nasal vaccine, which is opposite to the case of kids, I in which the nasal vaccine sprayed into the nose is better than the injectable vaccine. Is that right, John? I, they're probably equivalent, but, um, uh, and, um, uh, but um, certainly they've had good responses in children, but children tend to respond very well to vaccines anyway. Severe disease than did people that did not 
self-identify as being Aboriginal. The question is, is whether or not that was just because the epidemic was in the Northern community and that there was more um, people that had been exposed to the virus, or whether or not because of crowded conditions that people that were in that community, that community got an incredible infectious dose, which is another thing that can make you sicker. I actually can't tell, or whether or not there is a genetic grandfather trait that um, was passed from uh, generation to generation that may make some groups of people that are more susceptible to certain diseases. Now, there are other diseases where there's genetic traits that are, um, uh, that's another grandfather effect, um, where you'll find a group of people that are more susceptible to disease. So I, I can't actually answer all of that question, but it can be any one of those explanations. But it's because of what happened in 2009 that that warning came on, or that note came on that particular um, uh, vaccine, because we're still vaccinating against that same uh, strain. And I think we'll take one last question, please. One more chance. Okay, well, you've asked us excellent questions. And I'd like to, on behalf of the audience, first of all, thank our speakers. And I'd also very much like to thank Janine Presbyterian for organizing this session. Janine, thank you. And you owe you some thanks. The panel here for your excellent questions. They're very excellent questions. So thank you very much for coming to your attention.